And I just wanted to add a little bit before, before I get started. Um, big thank you uh, to the archives for asking me to uh, present today. This is the third time I've done one of these. Uh, the first one was a number of years ago. Uh, some research that I did of, of people who came to view from Ireland, um, some really big names in the world of um, Irish politics, um, social activists. I mean, there's a whole run of them, and um, I can tell you on the archive. I have an archive. You can access that. You don't have to listen to me talk. You can just read the script. <laughs> um, but uh, Eamon de Valera, Hannah Sheehy, Skeffington, all of them came to view. And um, that was the, really the first thing that led me into researching this time period because um, these famous people from Ireland came here for Irish independence and they all walked these streets that, me, they all walked these streets that um, we walk today. So I thought the historical connection was um, pretty unique. Uh, the second time, as Lindsay mentioned, was with the Robert Emmett Literary Association. They were part of a group that was called the Clan of Gale. And the Robert Emmets were the branch of the Clan of Gale. And at that time, I should mention from about 1880 to about 1925, the Clan of Gale probably was one of the most um, important Irish American organizations for fundraising. Um, I know you all probably have stories about um, sending money to Ireland for military and this and that, and uh, they all had a part in that. But education was part of it too. So the Robert Emmets, um, that was my second piece. And from that, Sorry. Maybe down here. Maybe the feedback off the Oh, so, oh, so, so, so I should come back for yeah. Yeah. Um, So then that led me to um, the Friends of Irish Freedom, and they were part of Clan McGill, but they were set up to be not so much um, involved in um, some of the things that the Robert Emmett's did. So this is a very unique group in terms of fundraising and also humanitarian aid that they sent to Ireland. So there's three things that I'm going to talk about that um, shows how Butte supported Irish independence through the Friends of Irish Freedom. So I'm going to kind of, as all things, start with Ireland. And um, I have a couple pictures. I, oh, and by the way, I have pictures, so there's a lot of facts in here, so I'll mix it up with some pictures of Ireland so you won't have to <laughs> think that it's a class or anything. Um, but anyway, on the left here are uh, the Aran Islands. Uh, you can access the Aran Islands uh, from County Clare or from Galway. If you go to uh, County Clare, Dooland is your drop-off point for the Aran Islands. There's a series of islands out there. Historical and uh, it's amazing with the rocks and the walls and the people um, and a very unique area. To the right over here uh, is on the um, east coast of Ireland, south of Dublin. Um, between Bray and Greystones. This is an incredible walk that you can take along the Irish Sea. So I just wanted to start with that, just kind of ground us here a little bit. I know some of you have, um, I don't know why that's showing up there, but there you go. Let's see if I can get rid of that, there we go. Um, I know you have roots, um, especially in Butte with the Barrett Peninsula. And Go back one more. Sorry, I get the pointer down here. <laughs> there we go. Um, so anyway, um, down in this area would be Cork and the Barra, and of course Alley has a connection with um, with you. So I just want to point that out. And then also uh, from my own family in County Clare, which I'm just going to talk about here for a second. Um, my Irish connection. I just wanted to do a brief introduction. I'll get into the meat of the program here. Uh, but my grandparents and aunts and cousins are all from County Clare. Um, this particular cottage up here is where my grandmother, aunts, and cousins all lived. And then across the road is where my grandfather and my cousins lived, and it's a town called Hennestine. It's about two miles from the ocean, it's by La Hinge. And uh, my grandfather came to America, and when he came to America, he left all of his family there. That's his twin brother, Patrick, right there. There's three sisters, and I'm sure some of you have this story in your family as well. They never saw him again. They wrote letters back and forth. Um, my grandfather, well, one story. This was a household of women, uh, mostly men here. Um, so this is just across the road. They would put sheets whenever they needed some help with hay or whatever. 
and the sheets were the way of telling the common boys they needed to come up and help. Not that the women couldn't do anything, but you know how many hands make things go a lot lighter. And so uh, my grandfather obviously spent more time up there um, because when he came to America four years later, he sent money uh, to my aunt, or excuse me, to my grandmother to come, and they were married in Illinois. Um, Unfortunately, that money didn't go to the Conlins here, and so the first time we went to Ireland, they were asking me where that money was. <laughs> uh, with, with interest, by the way. <laughs> that was one of the first things they said to me. I was like, ooh. <laughs> we're going to be here for three weeks, and they're going to be a long three weeks. <laughs> but anyway, that's that. Um, so they're in Oh my goodness, sorry. They're in Austin, Decker. Their neighborhood, um, basically, this is a mountain uh, in the Burren, Mullickmore. It's a huge limestone thing that goes all the way down to the ocean. Probably some of you are familiar with the Cliffs of Moor. Uh, this is right looking from Doolin up, from, so Doolin would be north. And then this is the town that they grew up in, Ennistymond. Uh, that's the River Ina, which runs right through there. Uh, one of my cats is named Ina. Keeping it going there. Um, okay, a little bit about me, real quickly. I, I'm not from Montana. Um, I grew up in Peoria, Illinois. It's on the Illinois River. Uh, the river runs down into the Mississippi. Uh, it's between Chicago and St. Louis. Two people famous. You may recognize Richard Pryor to the left. He's a famous uh, person from Peoria, Illinois. When I was a kid, people didn't like him. Um, but now there's a statue to his honor in Peoria, so it shows you how things change. And then over here in the music world, maybe some of you are familiar with Dan Fogelberg. He's folk and rock and grew up really not too far from where I lived. Um, whoops, let me go back up here. Um, after I went to Dallas High School, I wandered out here to the University of Montana. Had a great experience there, wonderful professors, and I can't recommend it more. The Montana University system is awesome. Um, then eventually made my way down to this little town, Stevensville, Montana. Um, bought a little house down there, and the Bitter Roots are one of my favorites over here to hike um, and that. And then um, made my way to Butte after I retired from teaching. Okay, a couple things here that we're going to talk about. I'll review these. As I mentioned at the very beginning, Clan de Gale, the most powerful Irish American organization from like 1880 to about 1920. They formed branches in the United States. The Robert Emmett Literary Association was the branch here. They formed the Friends of Irish Freedom as more of a, um, an organization which would um, dispute Irish propaganda. They were, they were really afraid that the British were getting really close ties with America, and so they wanted to fight that. And so that's one of the reasons that the Friends were set up. And then later on, unfortunately, the Friends kind of died out, and it kind of transitioned into the American Association uh, for the Recognition of the Irish Republic. I wish that was shorter, but it's not. Um, but anyway, we'll get to all these as we go along, and I'll review these as we go through. Okay, so if you have a, just a little background, if you have an organization, you need people. And if you don't have um, a lot of people, it, it doesn't work. So when we look at the 1910 census, um, there's a huge amount of people who have a connection with Ireland. And when you think about it at this time period, from like 1900 to about 1920, a lot of these people that came to America from Ireland, they had a huge distrust and dislike of the British government. You know, there was colonial rule, um, land, voting, religion, the whole thing. It was, it was not, not a good situation. And so they came to America with that dislike of English, uh, British uh, rule. And when you look at how many people were here, it would, it would make sense that you'd have a pretty large population to, to jump into some of these groups. Um, and then also, um, you know, when you look at this population at that time, 91,000 and so many in this country had roots with the Irish. So there's a huge pool of people that you could, that you could um, jump into with this. Okay, I call Butte, you've seen this before, it's Ireland's fifth province. Well, there's four historic provinces. I saw this in the Irish Times a number of years ago, and I thought, oh, okay, fifth province, that makes sense. It's a compliment to Butte, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, look at some of the statistics of people who left. County Mayo population, Mayo's up in the northwest, 388,000 by, you know, short time later, it's down to 192. 
four and a half million people came to America and to Canada, Argentina, all over the place. The diaspora is incredible. And I'm trying being generous, but I think from people that I've spoken with, there's probably at least 20 to 25 percent of this population, and that could be even more. So there was a, a, a lot of possibilities here. Okay, so when you came to um, the United States, this is my aunt's passport, by the way, from 1922. Um, she left Dublin. Uh, that's the cover. That's the inside of it. And up here, she hated this. Occupation, Patty's made. If you ever wonder why the Irish were really um, disliking the British, that whole condescending thing about um, the way they looked, the way they talked, and the whole thing. She went to Chicago and worked at this little place. It's called the Fort Knightley Club in Chicago. It was a women's philosophical society. They would have talks given by a lot of famous people. If you're familiar with Jane Hull of Hull House, she was a um, social worker who was a, basically been interested in women's voting and suffrage. Well, she spoke there and many others as well. So I just wanted to point that out that um, Beautiful picture of her, by the way. That's my Aunt Catherine. I spent a lot of time with her way up into my 20s. Um, she worked here, and then she went back to Ireland. <laughs> kind of unique. OK, let's get into it. Important events here. All right, first of all, Home Rule and Irish Parliamentary Party declines. So Home Rule was limited rule for Ireland. British um, government was still in charge of what was going on. There was a few things that you know, the Irish could do. And the, the idea was that, that this would be a stepping stone to full independence. So I'll come back to these. Also, at the same time period I'll be talking about today, at the Easter Rising in 1916, you have World War I, America gets in in 1917, Ireland has a war of independence from these dates. Um, Ireland declares a parliament and independent, Irish Free State Treaty, and then there's a civil war. So I'm going to come back to every one of these so you don't need to memorize them or anything right now. Okay, so here's the home rule people. So as I mentioned, um, this is Charles Parnell Stewart. This is John Redmond. They really felt that um, a step-by-step -step process would get them to Irish independence. So it was like a constitutional thing. It wasn't the physical force people like the Clan de Gale. It wasn't uh, rising up in arms, and, and uh, but it was more, you know, but not all of it was popular. This is from Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, if you know, in 1920 became part, the six counties became part of the British Empire. This is a poster which I found out, and they didn't want Home Rule to happen because they were afraid that um, they would lose their autonomy and they wouldn't become part of Britain. So if just the historic, historically, 26 counties in Ireland right now, six are up in Northern Ireland, the six belong to the UK. Everybody's got that down, so it gets a little, people sometimes wonder about how that all happened. And that was basically 1920. But anyway, home rule is what's going on in Ireland right now, and home rule is what's being accepted by the Clan of Gale, so to speak, and the Robert Emmets, okay? That's kind of where that goes. Now, the two who didn't believe in that, and this is where we get into the Friends. Um, John Devoy was born in Ireland, Dublin, came to New York, and Frank, um, Goldman was a New York State Supreme Court Justice. These two hated England. When you read the, their books, they just could not stand England or anything about England. And they were really afraid that at the turn of the century, 1900s, that there was a, um, a real danger that Ireland's um, quest for independence was going to get lost because England, uh, England and America were getting really close. They were signing treaties. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was in favor of uh, uh, was in favor of closer ties, and so um, they wanted to have an organization that would be kind of like a mouthpiece for the Plan de Gale, so that they would dispute any of the propaganda, any of the media, anything that was coming out that would be anti-Irish. So it was a big task. So they got together, talking about it. And so they thought that they would set up an organization, which leads me kind of to the friends of Irish freedom. Another one who was a big power broker is Joseph McGarity. He was a Philadelphia clan in Yale. And I mention him because later on, the three of them were going to be at each other's throats. So what they did was they sent a little thing here to all the branches 
of the Robert Emmett Literary Association asking for delegates to send to an Irish race convention. And the Irish race convention was what set up the Friends of Irish Freedom. So here's a little thing that came to view. I might mention too that the archives here has these little prints that I got from Aubrey. So she did a, it was really nice to, and uh, Lindsay actually is helping out quite a bit with this. And um, this came from New York to Butte. Put your names on here, the people that you would like to send to this convention so that you can elect these people to be part of the Friends of Irish Freedom. Here's the directive. Send a delegate or delegates to the Irish Race Convention to be held March 4th, 1916. <coughs> Easter Rising happened just about a month and a half afterwards, so there's your time frame here. So the Butte branch, the Klein and Gale, is the Emmets. They established a committee of five to make arrangements. Now I mentioned this right here, Brother 58. Robert Emmets, if you took in my last presentation, they were a secret society basically. They went by numbers. So he might be number 25, I might be number 10 or whatever. Um, and so I had to do a little search on this. But I think the person that they were talking about, his name was Mike Moriarty, but I can't confirm that. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, but I know some delegates went to this from view. <laughs> they met at the Hotel Astor, which is in New York. Oops, sorry. Um, and over here is the Finland, you recognize that. Some of the architectural features of the Finland um, were taken from the Astor. So there's some comparison there, kind of an indirect time. Um, so the Friends of Irish Freedom. If you read through this, it's kind of vague, which Help them out quite a bit because you got a big pot of money coming in here. So the purpose of the organization was to promote the cause of Ireland in the United States. So they wanted education, they wanted people to know that um, Ireland's independence had not been achieved yet and they were, they were working through legislating, like writing letters, uh, pamphlets, newspapers. John Boy, earlier slide, he had the Gaelic American, that was a big newspaper, um, to encourage Oops, I'm going to keep on quoting up someone. Um, get my finger here. To encourage and assist any movement that will tend to bring about national independence, pro-American, anti-British, <coughs> fundraising education, which I'll get into in a second, counter-British influence. They were neutral in World War I. If you remember back in those days, um, Ireland's um, opportunity was if something happened bad to the British Empire. So there was a lot of pro-German sentiment in the Robert Emmett Literary Association. Um, and so a lot of that was um, they did not want to be uh, part of World War I. Now when World War I came around and people started from Butte, started going into the service, that whole thing kind of changed around. But there's a high degree of loyalty to the United States. Every time you look at something that the friends did, uh, they always mentioned you know, the United States and their patriotism. They didn't want to be looked at as a anti-American group. So there's a very pro-American that way. Okay, so Friends of Irish Freedom. They got started um, at that Irish race convention, and they had, it wasn't a fly-by-night organization, they had everything laid out for how to organize them. So all this came to view, how to organize them. Then their meetings were run like this, and the Emmets were like this too. If some of you have been on foundations or committees or commissions or whatnot, basically it's Robert's Rules of Order. So it was, you know, it was pretty, pretty organized that way. And then we get to view. Attention, Irish Americans. I mean, some of the clippings here, they're going to form a Friends of Irish Freedom at Hibernia Hall. And Hibernia Hall was shared with the AOH and the Robert Emmets. So just some press clippings here. And then we get into um, the start of the Butte Friends of Irish Freedom. This is the Patrick Pierce. If you follow Irish history, you know Patrick Pierce, or Patrick and Podrick. Um, I was kind of surprised they went with Patrick, but I guess they figured it was an American group. Uh, this is Jeremiah Lynch over here. He was one of the big movers <coughs> and shakers with that. And that was adopted June 18th. So let's go back. March was the start of the Friends of Irish Freedom in New York. It only took them a couple months to get one started here in Butte. Now you could nominate people. I'm just kind of going through some of the bits here real quick. Um, you could nominate people to be part of the um, 
uh, of the group. So here you go. Enclose the name of so and so for membership. The thing that I'll talk about here is the Robert Emmons were a men's group. The Friends of Irish Freedom were open to anyone. It didn't matter who you were. You had to have some Irish ancestry, but women and men served uh, on the Friends of Irish Freedom, which I thought was quite different than some of the other groups. Um, so anyway, and I have some of this information if you want to look. You may have a relative out there somewhere that you might be able to find. There was also these little membership cards. This is all on the information here at the archives um, for how to nominate someone. This comes, and then in, in, if you were a, uh, a member, a card carrying member, you got one of these to carry around. So initially in Butte, there were 76 members, 41 were women, 50 were Irish born, and in 1920, there were a little over 1,200 Butte members. 100,000 national membership. This number got, gets a lot bigger as I move on here. Here's your little membership card. You got your dues and all that. And this is what I would really like to bring to your attention. Um, Montana right here, listed. There's your membership. More membership card, I like this one. Some of these are like, I've known in my lifetime. <laughs> 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 so I went through all the cards that we had at the archives. So there, this, the archives is great for a lot of things, but um, unlike the Robert Emmett Literary Association, the Friends of Irish Freedom, the minutes were really sparse. So I had to really piece together. So I um, apologize for not having more than 62 nominations, but at least I found these. 45 were born in Ireland and 8 were from the U.S. There was 19 minors, 15 housewives, three seamstresses, three blacksmiths, and three assistant priests. Um, the thing that I found interesting was is that um, when you read the information from, like, say, New York and Boston, most of those people were not this occupation. They're a little bit more uh, up to do. And so um, you have kind of the salt of the earth here, I think. It's kind of cool. One of the biggest nominators was this woman right here, Mary E. Cosgrove. She was also a secretary and treasurer of the Butte Friends of Irish Freedom. This is Eamon de Valera when he came to Butte. She's given, I wish that was a better picture of her, but kind of giving the impression that the women were a big part of this particular group. Now you could also transfer. So if you're in Butte, you say you live to Leadville or whoever else had a um, uh, Friends of Irish Freedom, you could do that. Okay, home rule, we are talking about that. Then all of a sudden, the Easter Rises comes about. And this is the GPO, and Easter Rising is in April. Most of you know the story about that. Um, cool. If you want, you know the Proclamation for Irish Freedom and Independence was read from the steps by Padre Pierce. I'll leave this up here, and you can take a look at it. If you've not read it, it's pretty inspiring. We have it hanging on the wall at the house. Um, so here's um, that. There's a few of the Irish Republican Army people. I'm mentioning this because this has a connection with the friends here. This is a pr pretty dramatic poster which was uh, put out. Um, that's James Conley. By the way, he was wounded during the uh, Easter Rising and he couldn't stand and so the British put him in a chair at Kilmainham <coughs> and executed him. And that was, um, if you want to know why people didn't like the British government or the British Army, there were 14 more of them that they did and um, I'll get into that here in a second. Um, but what had happened was is that there were so many people who were impacted by the, by the Easter Rising, not only just the Irish volunteers and citizens, but just general citizens of Dublin. And so there's a big concern, a humanitarian concern about their welfare. And so what had happened was that um, they decided to have an Irish relief program. And so the youth goal, I put a question mark there because it's kind of iffy. This is my only iffy one here. I have two more I'm going to talk about. But I know for a fact that $2,600 was raised for this Irish relief fund, which in 2024 would be about $73,000. Um, and that was to go to Dublin to go to Ireland. And the reason I mention that is because, yes, there were, there were um, soldiers and that, but when you look at this, 
180 civilians, think about how many families were impacted by the Easter Rising. And then down here, 3,000, whoops, 3,500 taken prisoner and 1,800 sent to internment camps. So there were a lot of, and then when you execute 14 people, sometimes I wonder about the British government and their policy. Wouldn't they think that that would have an impact in Ireland when you execute their leaders? I, I, I don't understand them, but anyway. But anyway, you can kind of see that, and then also with the volunteers who were killed. Um, so here's a couple of the internment camps where some of these people went. Um, this is Kilmainham. Probably some of you have been there before. Um, that's uh, I highly recommend this if you go to Dublin, by the way. Kilmainham Jail. The, the tour is. Uh, Brian Connolly does an excellent job there. Sure, he's still there. He'll be there for life. Um, and then over here is an internment camp that was in Wales. So you have all these people who have been either killed or displaced, and so that's why they needed money. And I talked about propaganda. Look at the Butte Miner, how they, how that this was reported. This is the Easter Rising. When I was a kid, my dad said there were no greater heroes than the people who were killed at the Easter Rising. Look at the Butte Miner. Revolt, seditious, futile, meaningless, criminal. Um, Half-hearted attack. I mean, it was not the propaganda through the media was incredible, um, and so it was very um, uh, pro-British. And so, going back to Du Bois, wanting to have a group that would counter that. That's how this kind of all got about. And the worst one was from John Redmond, who I showed you earlier. Mercy for the great mass of unfortunate dukes involved. I mean, this is someone who was a pretty big politician in Ireland at the time. Okay, so here's some more propaganda. Okay, this is after the Easter Rising. Here's women gathering um, wood in Dublin with smiles on their faces. And then over here, the real sufferers from the rebellion. So I'll just kind of leave that for you to think about for a while. Um, I don't know, I just, I just really struck me as propaganda in some way. Yes, it shows that the kids are are hurting, but there was a lot, a lot deeper than that that the papers didn't want to acknowledge that Ireland was trying to get independence from England. So, so here's the 1916 Irish Relief Fund. The Friends of Irish Freedom had a prominent role in the relief of suffering from the unspeakable want and distress from the, from the Easter Rising. And then this is newspaper clippings from a few papers, um, mentioning here between five and six thousand dollars. I think they made it, but I can't document that. I can only document about 2,600, which I, I think they did, I believe it at that. Here's your subscriptions. I mean, you'd be reading this in the Butte papers if you were living in Butte at the time. This is what be in your papers. I mean, I think it would really, um, here's all the pledges. I found all these pledges. I really kind of went down a deep hole with that. So, But um, more information in here. It's a fascinating story. Um, not only, so how did they collect money? Sometimes you went to mass or memorial service and after the mass and you'd be asked to give money from the Irish Relief Fund. Mm -hmm. They, and as some of you have done fundraisers before, um, you know how it works. These, um, these programs are amazing though because they'd have speakers and music and they collected money that way as well. So the was pretty involved. Uh, dances, um, Thousands will attend mass meeting at the auditorium. This is all for Irish Relief Fund. It's just a humani humanitarian effort, which is incredible. So here's the results. 100,000 been collected in the U.S. and later 350,000. That's $10 million in 2024. Uh, come down here to um, Butte, 2540, minus some of the expenses. It's a little over $75,000 that was sent to Ireland for humanitarian relief. So a little bit more about that. There's a little more documentation for you for those of you who are interested in that. There were several race conventions. I'm only going to talk about two of them. There was one in Australia, there was one in um, Argentina, wherever the Irish diaspora happened to be. But this next one has to do with the next fundraising thing. 1919 uh, race convention was in Philadelphia. It was at the Armory downtown Philadelphia, and also at the Academy of Music. So I put two photos up of that just to show you what would be going on there. The purpose of this was 5,000 delegates. Um, you're probably familiar with James E. Murray, our senator, back in the old days. He was a, a, 
a big supporter of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. He was a delegate. Bishop Carroll was a delegate. So there's a lot of Montana ties here. Um, to, so what happened was, uh, I'll get to this in the next slide or two, um, but after this one, you know, they just kept on gradually increasing their membership. And this particular Irish Victory Fund, so this is the second one now, so Irish Relief for Dublin, this one Irish Victory Fund, um, this was for uh, the fund work in America. So this is public education to dispute any propaganda that was coming out from England. England was great about saying how great the conditions in Ireland were. And if you know anything about that, that wasn't the case. And so the, the friends wanted this victory fund. They wanted big pool of money to work on public education. The most important thing about it was right down here, funds to stay in America. It wasn't to go to um, Ireland at all. They were still interested in advocating uh, for a uh, free and independent Ireland, but the money was to stay, so this is, that's an important point coming up here in a minute. Here's a, this is a great poster. Um, if you look at this, the Friends of Irish Freedom were really big on tapping into some of the events <coughs> in America to show that the independence movement in Ireland was similar to like our American Revolution. So you had um, mention of 1776, the Civil War, War, you know, <laughs> these two were against England, um, but anyway. Um, but there was a Monitor's um, Brigade, you know, Thomas Francis Monitor, the statue in front of the hell in the Capitol. Um, he, you know, he had his own incredible famous um, general from Ireland. So they really tried to tap into that, um, the patriotism and the tie to the American Revolution. So what we ended up doing was coming up here in Butte, raising a fund for uh, this Irish Victory um, Drive Fund. And James E. Murray was um, right here. At that time, he was uh, probably pretty much in starting his career as county attorney here in Butte. And over here, Anaconda was chipping in at the Margaret Theater and the Law Show. Um, so there was, Anaconda had a big part in this too. But since we're in Butte, I'll talk more about Butte. Um, so the money collected um, was by the Friends. Montana, most of that was viewed. 14426 that's a little over $200,000, which was collected in 2024, just to stay in America. It's a huge pot of money that was just sitting there, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute here. Um, <coughs> Billings, I put as a second. I couldn't find Anaconda, so if anyone's here from Anaconda, I apologize. I have a feeling Anaconda was second, but I can't say, but. So anyway, just the record's kind of scarce. And in um, 1919, at drive, the fund drive closed with a total of a million dollars, which is $18 million that was raised. So that's a huge pot of money, so I want you to keep that in mind because that's where it's gonna get kind of tense here in a few minutes. Here's the finances, uh, Montana right there. These are all the big states here. But I'll show you something interesting. Whoops, not that. So this fellow, Michael Dorley, um, collected data on 37 states. There's Montana. We outperformed 26 states. So when you think about the contribution of Butte and Montana, it's pretty amazing. Here's New York with, with that much money, with 10 million population. You know, we were down here with 549,000. And yet still, you know, Montana outperformed 26 states, I think. And most of those were out on the East Coast. Just to let you know, it was all audited. <laughs> really, this, I love it. this was in the paper, by the way. Talk about transparency in newspapers these days. Um, this one's even better. As treasurer of your committee, you know, and some of this was um, taken away for expenses, and then Jay Harrington was a treasurer. So this was, so it's all documented. It wasn't a big pot of money that was just going to be willy-nilly, but. Um, so, um, this is now back to Ireland. At the same time period, they had an election. Well, you know that back in those days, um, Ireland had uh, representatives who went to Westminster in England. And so, um, Sinn Féin, who is still in power, uh, rapidly gaining more power in Northern Ireland and, and the Republic of Ireland, that was de Valera's party, they had an election. You have to remember now, Ireland's part of Britain, 
they have an election that says we're a separate parliament from England and we're an independent republic. That's kind of typical Irish, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> when you think about that, okay, we're part of your country, but we don't, we're just going to set up. So I call it a counter government. And at that same day, there were two police officers who were killed in County Tipperary, and that really began the war of independence. So there's Eamon de Valera. Here's where the Parliament, and at that time it didn't meet there at Lancaster House, but I put a picture of the Parliament there in Dublin. It's a great building to go tour if you're over there. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back up. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to float a bond, they call it a certificate, but also a bond drive to fund a new government. Because when you think about it, you have a new government, you need money for courts, police, and the whole thing. So he had this idea to have a bond drive. Now, of course, there were a lot of Irish in, in the United States, and so he thought he would tap into that. Here's the first parliament. For those of you who follow along here, there's Michael Collins right there. There's De Valera. I mean, the list goes on with these guys. But I don't want to not talk about the women that come on the bond. They were the most radical Irish group of people that could ever out there. And um, they were the first to um, oppose the Irish Free State Treaty, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So you probably know about Constance Markievicz. She came to Butte. She would have been part of this. Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, who I'll get to here in a little bit. All of these women. Um, and they also participated in the Easter Rising. It all wasn't just guys. The women were part there. Constance Markievicz was in charge of her own little uh, battalion during the Easter Rising, so I don't want to diminish. This is one of the most underreported stories in Ireland's history. If any of you are ever interested in following up on this, I'd like to find out there was a Command of Bond group here in Butte or Montana or anywhere. So that's kind of where I want to right after I get done. Okay, so funding a new government. The bond right's going to do all these things. It's going to fund the courts, the police, land. They floated an, in, an internal bond program, but they had a goal of 10,000, or excuse me, 10 million dollars in America. Now this was coinciding with the victory drive, which I just talked about. De Valera saw that huge pack of money and he wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he wanted that money from the victory drive. Uh, the judge and uh, John Devoy uh, didn't want him to touch it. So there's a lot of tension, and I mentioned this, there's a lot of division. This whole thing with Irish independence, it wasn't um, everybody holding hands. There were a lot of people who were really upset with one another about the goal and direction of where it should go. And then um, Joseph McGarity was an uh, ally of De Valera. So the judge and Devoy kind of versus these two here coming up. So the Friends of Irish Freedom finally gave up and said, okay, you can have some of that money that's in the Irish Victory Drive. And so they gave 100000 to get the bond drive going. They gave 25000 to De Valera when he toured and he came to Butte. Gave 100000 to the Parliament to get started. And most importantly, 75,000 um, members in their addresses. Mm -hmm. So when they ran that bond drive, those addresses had Butte addresses. So you get a thing in the mail saying, subscribe to this Irish bond drive, which I think is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, De Valera. So he toured the United States, one of his tours. And uh, he started, and here is Butte, Anaconda, and Helena. Look at that wide nowhere. And then on the west coast. And then his second tour was down in the south. So he was busy collecting money for uh, the Irish parliament. So what happened was, to do all this, you need an organization. So in Butte, each state appointed a chairperson for uh, the bond drive. They had supervisory. There was a chair that was in the city. So then Butte was divided up into districts. It's no different than um, someone running for public office. They go door to door, street to street, block to block, canvassing collections for the Irish bond drive. And there was a treasurer responsible for safeguarding all the funds. So uh, I emphasize again, it was pretty organized, and it wasn't anything that was just thrown together. Here's our man right here, James E. Murray. He was the state <coughs> chair. He was one of the biggest, um, I would say the top five of all the Irish in this country 
involved in Irish independence. It's an incredible historian. Mm -hmm. I wish I had more time to get into it a little bit more deeper. Um, but there's Murray. The view goal was 100,000. I got 107,000. That's over a million and a half. He was a little bit of his bio there. And as I mentioned, he was a New Deal supporter and his FDR um, ally. Um, but up there, the U.S. goal was 10 million, and they got 5.8 million for, um, it wasn't for ammunition, it wasn't for guns, it was for the Irish Parliament to set up, pay your salaries for your people, send people, you know, envoys, diplomatic, things like that. That's pretty amazing. So if you subscribe to the Bond Drive, there you go, you got a little certificate. Nice, huh? I wish I had one. <laughs> and then, um, we had, coming up here in a second, we had, um, I have a newspaper, an Anaconda kind of Standard here you can look at real quickly after you're done if you like. Um, and I mentioned a partial uh, subscription, so 1,200 in view, 300, 300,000 nationwide. These are newspaper articles about the bond drive. Once again, you pick up the local newspapers and talking about the bond. And there's Anaconda, there you go. You should be proud of your Anaconda roots if you have them. They were right in there. I might mention too that there was four branches of the Friends of Irish Freedom. One was in Anaconda and three were in Butte. The Patrick Pierce is the one that I have the most information on. All this was in here. All this is so transparent, which leads me to more information. You were kept abreast whether it was going to be closing, when it was closing, when you need to get your money in. And then it wasn't accepted by everyone. There were some people who felt that it was just a total scam and scheme that you'd be collecting money and sending it over to a government that wasn't really officially recognized by the international world as a government. But, you know, that's, that's how the Irish rolled. <laughs> this is why, this is, when you're researching stuff, there's some things that are just, I can't stop talking about this, and so I was telling Lindsay and Tyler about it all. I have this one here in the paper. Um, an Anaconda standard, so please look at it. This is a partial list of everyone in Butte who subscribed to the bond list. You may have a relative on this list, and you can look them up right there on that book. Um, and then also the transparency down here about how much has been collected. Um, and most of it's in alphabetical order, so you may be able to find someone in that list that is, is part of your family. Um, so I broke, I've been, uh, you know, I taught math in school, that's one of my things, so I'm kind of into math, sorry. But um, I broke it all down, I went through all of that. I'm not done with it all, but I went through this. So here's the $10 subscribers, or 36%, 25 So when you come down here, 71% of the bond certificates are, 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 um, were $25 or less. So it was kind of a common person who was doing this. It wasn't um, the, your real high rollers. Although I will say that Ryan from Anaconda ACM gave $1,200. I think he was the top, but he was a rare exception. Um, down here, so 10 bucks would be equal to about $180 right now. So depending on your salary at that particular time. Um, so I went through all that. I'm not quite done with, with doing the research on that, but I wanted to show that because this really differed from what I had read. I had read that most of the subscribers in the rest of the country were, were um, you know, not, not of, um, they were of higher income, I guess, I should say. Okay, so let's just go back up here one more time. I'll say one more thing about this. So just kind of recap, there's three things. The Irish Relief Fund, that money went to Dublin. The Victory Drive was to stop British propaganda. The Bond Drive was to form Irish to have the Irish Parliament. So all that money was going to Dublin. Some of it stayed here. Um, the Friends of Irish Freedom were also involved in public education. And the first talk I did here at the archives, I talked about 20 of these people who came through. And as I mentioned, I can show you how to, or how you can access all this. But Hannah Sheedy Skeffington came to Butte. And um, I'm just gonna pull up a quote here if I can. Um, that's her husband Francis right there. She came to um, Butte a couple times. She was involved in women's suffrage. Um, kind of a fact that a lot of people don't know is that Ireland um, gave the right to vote to women two years before the United States did, 1918. She was a big part of that campaign. Um, but she has a quote in here that um, she gave 250 speeches when she was in America. 
and she spoke to universities, civic groups, um, women's societies, and she spent 18 uh, months uh, in the United States. And she said when she came to Butte, I think Butte has more interest in Irish affairs than any other city in the United States, and that's saying a lot. The three best supporters of Irish cause are Boston, Chicago, and Butte. This is from, I talked about De Valera being the Irish man. She's the Irish woman. If you want to know about Hannah Sheehy Skeppington, and she has relatives and actually has come to Butte and talked about her. Um, another focus of her talk, though, um, especially the second trip, was she was anti-free state treaty. Um, mm -hmm. But um, her husband, Francis, was not really, he's a journalist, pretty famous. He was um, killed um, a few days after the Easter Rising. And he wasn't a participant in the Rising, but the British rounded him up. It's a really a sad story. Mm -hmm. He was killed indiscriminately by a British soldier. There was a commission report, I found it at the University of Montana Mansfield Library. Um, they never really did anything about it, so it was, it was just, it was really sad. So she came and talked about um, his, his, um, his life, but also um, the Easter Rising. So public education, you had people who had a direct connection to the Easter Rising who were coming. So that was fulfilling their mission of stopping British propaganda. Because the British were saying, well, the Easter Rising's nothing, is over within a week. They kept the story going for, for Butte. These people come to Butte, and um, I just, I think it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, she was also involved in the Irish Workers' Union, so labor rights, voting rights, and she was opposed to World War I. Um, she also said that the uh, Free State Treaty, which came in 1921, was a paper goat run by a mil British militarist, and she spoke in Anaconda and St. Mary's School. And another for public education was Liam Mellows, this fellow was pretty intense. Um, he was the he was what was called the advance man for Eamon de Valera when he came. Um, so he came to Butte, made all the arrangements. He went to San Francisco, made all the arrangements. An interesting story about him: most people think the Easter Rising was all in Dublin, um, but there were other sections of this country that were supposed to jump in on this, and he was in charge of about 700 men in Galway. Galway being on the west. And um, he wouldn't talk about it. When he came to Butte, I was reading these stories there, and newspapers were trying to pry, get information about it. So he finally broke down and, um, and gave his, his story of the Easter Rising. And so this is more, this is a man who participated in the Rising, who came to Butte. So here's that propaganda being disputed by people who had real life experiences um, there. Um, Liam Mellows said, uh, when he was here in 1919. I've been told that Butte's the most cordial city in the Northwest, but I believe that it's a paltry description. I should say that it extends a warm and welcome to, sorry, um, to a stranger within its gates as any other city in the United States. Mm -hmm. Pretty complimentary. Every one of these people who came to Butte said it. I have some incredible quotes from the, in the newspapers. Um, he wanted to come back to Butte but unfortunately, um, after the Irish Free State Treaty was um, started, the um, Irish Civil War, mm -hmm. and he took oops, he took over with others the four courts there, and British. Well, it was Irish versus Irish. The British were giving the uh, Free State Treaty people the guns, but he was rounded up, and he never made it back to view because he was executed for his participation in, in that particular mm -hmm. affair. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, a couple more things here. We're getting close to time here. Um, the Friends of Irish Freedom kind of had a decline here. There's the judge and De Valera. I mentioned it's tense. There were so many things that were going on. I could talk an hour about how they couldn't stand one another. And um, De Valera said that the United States wasn't big enough for the judge and him. Uh, the judge said that People come from these other countries and they think they know so much about the United States. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just really got ugly. And it's really a shame that the, all the organizations couldn't work together because they all wanted Irish independence. But they all had, I guess to a certain extent, all had a pretty big egos. <coughs> and they couldn't tell. Um, so De Valera wanted his own organization in the United States to handle money. So he started this American Association for Recognition of the Irish Republic. <coughs> And he wanted to take away. So at that time, the Friends of Irish Freedom membership 
they left and joined up with this group. And this is exactly what happened in Butte. But do you think Butte liked Devil Air, or do you think he liked the judge? I think it's Devil Air. <laughs> when you look at this headline, I mean, this is a showstopper. He, he arrives down at the Front Street Station. He has a parade uptown, goes to the courthouse. They're singing songs. He goes to the Finland. People are outside the Finland screaming and yelling for him. He was, he was really like a, a huge national hero. And uh, then he gives a speech down um, at the park, well, at that time, Duncan Field. Second in what, Oregon, I guess it is. Yeah, second Oregon. So imagine that, 10,000 people listening to Devil Air in Butte. So when you talk about, you know, people coming to Butte for the size of our town, I just, I just am amazed sometimes. The headline is incredible. James E. Murray, he was the state president. So here's Murray again. I'll be wrapping up here real quick. Um, thanks to the archives in the chateau, um, I was able to access this book um, that's <clears throat> a, a appreciation of his work for Irish independence and Irish freedom. And there's some heart-touching letters in here. This one, if I can point it out, um, where did it go? He stood with De Valera somewhere in here. I can't remember exactly where this one is. But you can see the, the attachment uh, mm -hmm. for uh, De Valera. And so that's why the Friends of Irish Freedom, yeah, here it is. <coughs> President uh, Eamon De Valera had um, no better you know, lieutenant in the whole affair. So Murray um, and Butte, he's, He's in charge of a huge organization. Eamon de Valera appointed him to be part of this. So the connection there with Butte and Ireland is pretty incredible. <clears throat> and so then, once again, here's the newspapers. Well, there's a branch of the American Association for Recognition of the Irish Republic. Um, the Friends of Irish Freedom basically were, were folding, and the um, Butte branch was folding and merged, transitioning into here. This is my next little um, research project that I'm going to be working on this group here. I'm just kind of getting into it a little bit more. There's a lot of information there. This is your application, so it's just like the, um, you know, there's some familiar names I'm sure in here. And then uh, they brought um, Mary McSweeney. That's her brother Terrence, who was the mayor of Cork. He went on a hunger strike for 74 days and he died. She came to Butte, told everybody about that, and she was part of, um, of the new uh, group for public education to keep the spirit alive. So this would have been in the uh, mid-20s, 1920s. Another story in Carbo. I have an archive program on her too. I can access that for you. So here we go. Let's follow the money. Getting close here. Um, our view totals 75, 200,000, 1.5 million. I mean, all that is going for, to help Irish independence in one way or another. Final thoughts. Well, several successful fundraising activities. They kept, this is most important, I think, kept the view to Irish community informed about conditions in Ireland, and they brought prominent Irish politicians and activists to Butte. It was an egalitarian organization. I think that's pretty cool for the, for the time period. Butte was an important participant, despite its size when you compare it to, like, New York. My hometown, which I mentioned at the beginning, Peoria, didn't have any of this. <laughs> so, and now they were south of Chicago. And um, there's a master's dissertation that I read, and um, I'm, I'm going to discredit his, him to that. The ties that bind, I really like that, connected to Butte. And um, when I think about that time period and how Butte and Ireland were really connected, I thought, well, what, how are we connected to Ireland now? Well, we have Henri Ra. So we have a hurling team here, the Wolf Tones. They're part, that's part of the Gaelic Athletic Association. That goes way back into time. Um, we also have the twinning with Al Hughes. That's cool. Um, Irish Studies Program at U of M. There's Fulbrights that come from Ireland that go teach at the University of Montana. We send students over there to them. Um, and then there's the Irish, and the Henri Ra Festival for music. I might mention that I looked at the schedule in Alton is going to be headlining. They're like a premier Irish traditional band from Donegal. All of you should go to see them up on the original stage. It would just be beautiful. So there you go. It's months away, but go for it. <laughs> and, yeah. Highly recommend them. And then I want to thank a few people. For one, the Public Archives, oh, University of Montana, Mansfield Library. Um, I had good experiences with all of them, but um, whoops. if I had to um, get if I had to uh, 
thank anybody greatly. I think the archives have all of it been so helpful for me. And if you have anyone um, that's interested in research, um, I also want a um, home base here for me, View Community Radio Station, KVMF. If you've not listened to KVMF, I highly recommend that you should. It's right across the street from the courthouse. You'll see a neon sign there. Uh, music changes every two hours. You'll find something in there. And there's also news in there as well, and arts productions. It's a community radio station. It's going on its ninth year now. So it's, it, it, it's pretty interesting. It's given me an opportunity to play Celtic, uh, Irish folk music from around the world. And then also to uh, Art Without the Crown is when I did a lot of um, my archive programming for viewamericaradio.org. Um, so that's it. If you have any questions, I welcome you to go up, look at this book up here. Maybe you'll find someone. There's two pages, by the way. There's a next over and next page over. And uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. If anyone has any questions or comments, I hope it wasn't too dry. Um, there's a lot of information there, but I think it does show that Ireland and Butte had a huge connection there, and uh, we should all be very, really proud. I'm not a Butte native, but it gives my heart uh, a lot when I think about it. And if you have uh, Butte ties, maybe relative back, excuse me, back in that time period, um, I think that that would be pretty special for all of you. So thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, I'll take them. Yeah.